So, you remember this commercial for one of the cell phone service providers? Our human sin problem. 
while it truly messes up God's intended relationship with us, has not completely wiped the image of God in which we were created away. At least it hasn't erased it from God's divine mind and intention. Even though we human beings so often turn our backs upon God, God cannot and would not do so in return. God takes the initiative and provides the means for restoring and renewing the relationship. Preparing grace prompts our first wishes and first attempts to please God. Our first faint flashes of understanding God's will for us and our, and our first twinges of, of consciousness that we have sinned against God. All that's God's initiative. But we can't pretend to ignore it. We can resist it. We can even refuse it. There's a classic painting by the artist Holman Hunt that's titled Christ at the Door. I remember seeing a copy of it in my dad's study in the parsonage in little old Warren, Indiana. That's the town I, I think I told you once was so small folks used to have to take turns being the town drunk. <laughs> and I've seen this, this, this print uh, in some of the small town and open country churches I've served or visited over the years. And maybe you recognize it. I mean, it's, it's a very, very nice, friendly, warm, fuzzy depiction of the Lord, right? But the most significant thing about that painting is what we don't see. There's no latch on the outside of the door. The side Jesus is on. He's knocking, but he can't come in unless the door is open from the inside. God's preparing grace is Christ knocking at the door of our lives, but we have to open the door and let it in. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, Listen, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. But we have to let God in. Now, we all, we all know, right, as good Protestants, we're not saved by our works, by the good things that we have done. That's what Martin Luther and, and all the Protestant reformers way, way back when were we're so adamant about it's not like you get a big tally sheet, right? And uh, you know, if, as long as there are more good deeds that we've done than bad stuff we've done, then we get to go to heaven. Huh? I don't know about you, but over the years of ministry, I can't tell you how many times at funerals I've heard people say, "Well, you know, he did enough good things. I'm sure he's in heaven." That, that's not. That's not it. We're not saved by our works, by the good things that we do. But here's something interesting that, 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 that may set you back a little bit. We're not saved by our faith either. either. And what do I mean by that? Well, we're saved by God's amazing grace through our faith that is ignited and kindled by God's preparing grace. A stirred up conscience and a soul that, that God's preparing grace has woken up from its lethargy, from its long spiritual nap, if not coma. God's saving grace is relational. And, you know, last time I checked, relationships always, they, they take at least two, right? So when God asks, can you hear me now? And we finally can hear God calling. We can answer yes. Or, let me call you back later. <laughs> or, no. Remember what I taught you just two weeks ago, that unlike our Calvinist brothers and sisters, we Wesleyans believe that God's grace, as amazing and as awesome as it is, is also resistible. 
But the good news is that in the face of our resistance, our disinterest, our deferrals, we keep, or we keep letting it go to voicemail, God keeps coming. God keeps showering us with preparing grace. Think of the parables that we read from Luke's Gospel. Ninety-nine sheep do what good sheep should do. They stay with the herd in the middle of the wilderness while God goes after the one that's lost, whether it wandered off unintentionally or intentionally. God goes searching until He finds it. God's like a woman who loses 10% of her money. Unlike most of us who might be inclined to look for a little while, but then we rationalize stopping the search because at least we have 90% left, God searches high and low until He finds it. Now, do you remember what happened at the end of each of those parables? Huh? What happened? Do you remember what happened? Celebrating. Celebrating. That's right. God threw a party. Party in heaven. Because the missing has been found. The relationship been restored. Some of you may remember Disney's uh, animated movie The Lion King. And in, in that movie, Mufasa, the king of the lions, is killed. And Simba, his cub, his rightful heir, is cheated out of his place in pride by his evil, snarky Uncle Scar. <laughs> and Scar's hench hyena. Simba runs away and he links up with Timon the meerkat and Pumbaa the warthog living the Hakuna Matata. No more his life. And then Rafiki, that crazy wise baboon, confronts Simba, reminding him who he is. The king of the jungle. Then Simba sees a vision of his father and he hears his father's voice say, Simba, I can't do it in James Earl Jones' voice. <laughs> you are more than you have become. And that's what our Heavenly Father says to us in preparing grace. You are more than you have become. You are meant to Live better than you are living. You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. Preparing grace is God's constant reminder of His vision for us. That we're meant to be more than we are. That we're not chained to our sins, our addictions, the people we've hurt or the people who've hurt us. God loves us and is whispering to our heart and soul that we're so much more than we have become. Preparing grace also makes us human beings morally responsible. Most of us, especially most of us guys, have the ability to be extremely selective in terms of our hearing. <laughs> We can tune someone out who's sitting right beside us in the car. Or at the dinner table. And we can hear a baby soft cry at the other end of the house. Similarly, we can listen to or we can tune out God's still, small voice. That mystical moment when God is so here. So now, urging us to, to turn away from everything that's leading us away from Him and return to the relationship He, he, he created us for, it. He's always wanted and He will always want with us. Because God has given us the human liberty, the free will to choose our response, 
It is a moral choice. It's a moral choice. And there are consequences to our response. The 20th century British scholar and Christian writer C.S. Lewis, many of you may know him through the, the Narnia Chronicles that he wrote. Great, great books for children uh, and adults. And he wrote many other really good uh, books for, for adults. He once wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Similarly, Dr. Billy Abraham, a brilliant and engaging Irish Methodist scholar on the faculty of our United Methodist Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University, he puts it so beautifully, he said, Provenient grace is the initial help God gives to everyone to see how grim things are to form the first intention to get help. Now this initial help to see how grim things are, that's got three dimensions. The first is what John Wesley called our God-given natural conscience. Wesley said its main business is to excuse or accuse to approve or disapprove, to acquit or condemn. Now, in 2016, you and I might say the main business of our natural conscience is to say something's either okay or not okay. The Apostle Paul understood that everyone has this natural conscience or experience of natural revelation. Remember our, our lesson from Romans 19. That God naturally reveals it, this to us, so we human beings, we have no excuse. Did you catch that last line? Yeah. We really can't say, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> For Christians, this, this conscience of right and wrong is defined and further developed beyond natural conscience by the Word of God, the lamp unto our feet light into our path. In the second dimension of preparing grace, this initial help to see how grim things are, is that it brings us to the point where we see ourselves for who and what we are. In churchy language, this is called conviction for our sin. We see ourselves clearly, we see God clearly, we compare the two, and there ain't no comparison, is there? It's a time when we see God, we see ourselves for who we are in relationship to God, and it doesn't look good. The video replay of our life starts to, to roll, and there is no hiding from the way we've been and the way we are. Preparing grace brings us to a moment of soul truth. God stepping into our inner life through the door that we open to Him to help us see what is wrong with us. And here's the good news. To then encourage and lead us to a positive response. A solution. God's solution. To what's wrong with us. Thirdly, provenient or preparing grace doesn't leave us writhing in a literal or, or figurative agony of realizing just how messed up we are, how far from God we are. Preparing grace comforts us, it assures us in ways we can't fully comprehend, much less define, that, that God is for us. God is there holding us up. God is, is even carrying us when needed like the well-known poem I'm willing to bet some of you have in your home somewhere called Footprints in the Sand. Fanny Crosby was born in the uh, early 19th century in New England. 
<clears throat> when she was six weeks old, she caught a cold and developed an inflammation in her eyes. The local doctor was out of town, so her parents allowed an unschooled traveling healer to put mustard poultices on her eyes. And she never saw again. Yet she became one of the greatest Methodist gospel hymn writers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, writing over 8,000 hymns. She gave old Charles Wesley a run for his money <laughs> on hymn writing. There, there are times <clears throat> in the 21st century in particular where we're uh, uh, too easily tempted to dismiss gospel hymns as old-fashioned, outdated. But I want you to, you know, get a hymnal. It's that, that blue book here. Okay. And turn to number 591. 591. look at the, the words, the lyrics for the second and the third verses. Because I think they speak powerfully about God's preparing grace. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive. They only believe. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness. Chords that were broken will vibrate once more. John Wesley preached over and over and over and over again that grace is for all and grace is in all. Through preparing prevenient grace, God stirs our conscience, whispers to our heart, wakes us up, wakes up our souls. God never overrules our human <coughs> right and liberty to resist His love. But God never gives up loving. God never gives up You can try your best, and, and you, you can actually succeed at, at holding God at arm's length. But you're not going to stop God from loving you. Because grace happens. I invite you to continue your worship with your tithes and with your offerings. Uh, our gold can offering this morning. 